Welcome to the Garage Network Podcast. Join us and the occasional special guest as we discuss everything automotive, from fixing cars as a technician, owning an automotive workshop or business, overall work-life balance, and even the occasional laugh. In this episode of TGN Talks, we were lucky enough to be joined by Scott Brown. Scott is the owner of Connie and Dick's Auto Service Center in California and also the creator of the Diagnostic Network. He's also an industry pioneer in not only automotive technologies, but he also spends a lot of time educating fellow technicians and also our customers. So we really hope that you enjoy it. Yeah, g'day guys. Welcome to the Garage Network. We're going to interview today with uh, Scott Brown from California. Uh, he's got a workshop with uh, Connie and Dix and, uh, and also is the, the founder of uh, Diag.net. Um, over to you, Scott. You might want to tell some of the guys a bit about yourself for those that don't know you. Sure. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, this is pretty cool to be able to do this long distance uh, talk and uh, presentation. Uh, so my name is Scott Brown and I am a, uh, technician by trade. Uh, I, when I left, uh, high school, I went to a trade school, uh, to learn about auto, auto mechanics. And that was in the very early eighties at that time, uh, computers were just now being introduced to the vehicles. And when I got into the field, I saw that, uh, most technicians didn't want it, anything to do with these computers. So I saw that as an opportunity. And uh, I also realized I didn't know hardly anything about cars uh, uh, compared to what was in the fleet. So um, I was on a mission to learn everything I possibly could and uh, get on top of it. And uh, it's been an awesome, awesome ride. Uh, and in the uh, early 90s, I was approached by uh, the two gentlemen that founded Connie and Dick's Service Center, uh, a gentleman named Conrad Nelson, and the other one was Richard Bixel. Uh, they asked me if I, I wanted to, if I was interested in coming to work for them and then buying their business. And uh, I'll tell you, I just thought that they wanted me to come to work for them. And I kind of like shined them off. And I didn't even, didn't even return their calls. Uh, but somebody was persistent enough to keep pushing me. And I finally set up a, a lunch with them. And, and uh, the rest is history. I, I was able to buy the business, buy the building. Uh, modernized the company and uh, continued to uh, chase the, the technology. And uh, boy, the technology has really uh, taken off. And it's uh, in the last oh, five or six years, it's really uh, picked up. And uh, that's what uh, we're going to talk about tonight uh, is the ADAS uh, stuff, the advanced driver assistance. I've been studying this uh, pretty heavily over the last uh, few years. And in fact, I'm doing a lot of hands-on instruction uh, here in my workshop. I'm partnered with uh, AES Wave. Uh, these guys are out in uh, California. I've known them for about 30 years, and uh, we have uh, we're onboarding their customers that buy equipment and uh, getting them trained uh, with some curriculum and then some hands-on uh, actual doing. So uh, this is the, that picture you see in my. My shop, that's part of that. Uh, that's the middle of my shop, uh, but that's some of the workshop stuff. We've got a nice big screen that drops out, and uh, we can actually get the scan tool data up there. Um, we can have uh, roughly 20 students in the class, so everybody can see what's going on. People are operating the tools and doing the calibration and, and all that good stuff. So um, so I'm happy to, happy to be here, guys, and uh, uh, anything else? We're happy to have you. I think <laughs> I think it's yeah, amazing. Man, no, just All fantastic right. To, yeah. Fantastic to have okay. you. Okay. Really good. Yeah. So we had a call last week, and uh, so we talked about, hey, what are we what are we going to talk about? And I said, well, hey, I've got this. I've got a short presentation on some ADAS stuff. This is the same or similar presentation to what I gave uh, to the folks at SEMA, and that is the Specialty Equipment uh, Market Association. These are the guys that make all the aftermarket stuff. They're concerned about the ADAS uh, features that are being put on the vehicles and what's going to happen to them when they lift them, they put bigger tires on them, they modify the vehicles. And so I was asked to give a presentation. And so um, we'll, we'll walk through this presentation. It's pretty well-rounded. Uh, it doesn't go in-depth, but it'll talk about 
some of the things, some of the questions that came up in your garage network, uh, one of them was about tooling, uh, OEM versus uh, aftermarket. And I've got a couple of slides here that, uh, that hit right on that. Um, and uh, so let's, let's go ahead and, and get started here. So if you want to get into this uh, business uh, of doing the ADAS stuff, you're going to have to know, have some knowledge of what kind of software you need. Um, you're going to need software actually from both the OEM side and aftermarket. I have experienced both cases where a uh, late model vehicle, the aftermarket software couldn't do a job, but the, after, the OEM could. And the same thing has happened with an OEM tool could not communicate. I could grab the aftermarket tool and it gets in and communicates with the vehicle and gets the job done. So we're dealing with software. And when you have high levels of soft, or lots of software, you're going to have strange anomalies and you're going to have to have workarounds to get things uh, triggered or uh, an operation. Um, talking about tooling, uh, that's going to be driven by the types of vehicles that you work on. Um, I'm not totally familiar with the marketplace. Uh, you know, I know you guys have a, a ton more models than we do, uh, different manufacturers uh, coming into the marketplace. But what we find here in the States is that a lot of the systems uh, or the components, say a radar sensor or a camera, uh, they're provided by uh, a, a small group of uh, suppliers. So they're, they're basically using the same tools. They're just being implemented a little bit differently uh, the calibration requirements may change, uh, even though it's the same sensor the, the manufacturer may have uh, dictated a different way to, to calibrate. So these are the things you, you have to be aware of. And so you need to look at your fleet. What is the What are the requirements? Read through the service information and uh, figure out what tools are needed. And we're, we'll have a couple screens here that show you some of the uh, tools that you may be able to just pick up at the hardware store. Um, it's pretty interesting. Uh, service information. Now, I know that you guys are, uh, this has been a very tough thing for you uh, to gain access to, but um, without the service information, it's going to be very, very difficult, uh, you know, especially when you have a, a, a challenge, right? When something isn't working, you need a wiring diagram, uh, you need to know who communicates with what, what network the, the devices are on, um, and so on. Um, you're also going to possibly have to have special facility space. Um, some of these cars have uh, surround view, um, so they have like a 360 view. Uh, when you replace cameras, sometimes you have to do a calibration operation, and it requires you to lay these target or mats around the vehicle, and you need to have a lot of space uh, in order to, to allow for that. So a lot of small garages, a lot of small workshops, uh, may not be able to handle that kind of work and uh, may have to actually sublet, uh, sublet that out. Um, and then the knowledge and skills, of course, are going to come with your experience and training and, and so on. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about a couple of challenges that we've had in the shop here, just to kind of lay out some of the real world uh, things that, that have happened. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm doing training here in the shop. And so whenever we have cards that come in uh, that need this kind of work, I'm really focused on looking at what are the failure modes, what's, what's happening with the vehicle, what are the difficulties. This particular vehicle came from a collision center we were working with, and it had just some minor cosmetic repairs uh, done on the vehicle, but I made an observation on this car when I looked at the forward-facing camera that was up in the windshield, and I thought, wow, there, there might be something going on here. Um, so we really weren't tasked with doing any calibration operations on this vehicle, but I, I told the body shop, hey, I'm going to work with this car because I think I, I see an issue. I took the car out and drove it, and the car drove fine. Everything worked just fine. But uh, I went through and I wanted to do a calibration operation on this vehicle. And uh, it requires you to set up a, a few targets. You can see the, the targeting mechanism that's sitting up out in front of the vehicle. Uh, you do some measurements, you set up that targeting, you go into the scan tool and you say, uh, calibrate. Well, this vehicle actually failed. Um, and when, it, when I went into calibrate mode, it, it instantly, you know, it said, oh, it, it's unable to calibrate. At that moment in time, it cleared out the old calibration and basically has now rendered the system inoperable. 
until it gets a new calibration. Um, and of course it says visit your dealer. So um, the observation that I made um, is that the windshield, you know, you're supposed to make sure that the windshield's clean, which is a logical step. But I noticed on the inside of the windshield, it, it appeared to be fogged up. And I thought, wow, how is that going to impair uh, the operation of, of the system? Um, and here it is. It failed during calibration mode. However, when I drove the vehicle out on the road and, and performance tested everything, that vehicle behaved properly. It, it picked up the lane lines. It did all the normal. Uh, it did everything that it was designed to do. It didn't really impair it. Um, so we pulled the camera down, took a look. You could see this heavy, oily film uh, on, the, uh, on the glass. So we cleaned it all off, put it back together. We hit the button on the scan tool to just retry it and it instantly calibrated. And it says everything's fine. And this is what we end up with. Um, we always want to take a value. You can go into your scan tool and usually do an initial measurement after you, you put your targets up take an initial measurement just to see where is the calibration currently in, in the vehicle. And then you want to do, when you do your calibration, then you're going to go back and take that measurement again and record it. You want to make sure that you didn't drift too far um, because something you could have induced a problem, but it's always a good uh, practice to take a snapshot of what the vehicle had in it before and then what, it has in it after you're done uh, with the uh, with the service. Um, talking about the tooling, so in that particular case, you know we're using an aftermarket device, and if you look, um, this is a service information for a 2020 uh, Nissan, and in the instructions in the service manual, they basically give you. Uh, PDF and it has these black and white little targets. You're, they expect you to print these things out, put them on a piece of paper, glue them on this board, and put them all up in this dimension here. So, a lot of people ask about aftermarket versus OEM. Well, this is the OEM method. The aftermarket is looking at these uh, these targeting systems and saying, "Hey, wait a minute, we can do a better job." Uh, Secondary to that is that the placement of these targets, because you're having to put them in a specific location out in front of the vehicle. I got a bug uh, flying at me here. Um, you have to put it in a specific location out. This, this guy is killing me here. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm talking to these Australian guys, and they're going to kick your butt if you don't, uh, don't let up. Uh, so anyways, these... Um, these targets, you know, they've got to be positioned in what we call Z space, right? Z space out in front of the vehicle at specific coordinates, uh, specific height. It's got to be level. It's got to be out in front of the vehicle, uh, measured in reference to the center line of the vehicle. And when you look at the OEM uh, procedure to do that, um, you're out there with plumb bombs and a lot of strings and you're measuring. And the aftermarket says, wow, you know, look at the time that it takes to actually set all this up. Can we come up with a better way to put these targets in place, saving the technician tons of time? And I can tell you that in the last three years of doing this calibration and using the OEM tools and aftermarket tools, the aftermarket tools have evolved tremendously. And... I can take a practice that would take roughly 35 to 40 minutes to set up a camera and a targeting uh, system down to maybe 10 minutes because the systems are now using some advanced measurements, measuring tools to help you assist in getting that target placed uh, in front of the vehicle properly. So it's pretty cool to see what's going on with the, uh, with the uh, aftermarket companies, because they're saying, "Hey, this is this is a a productivity problem, right? It's it's not something you want to have your technician spend three hours trying to put this target system in place, and then only do it once a month or once every two months. Because when you come back to it, you're going to have the same challenges. You're not going to be able to be very proficient. Well, these aftermarket tools will help you get them in in position." The downside to some of the aftermarket tools is that so in some cases, they may be actually trying to um, skirt uh, or change the, the metrics. 
So if you look at the, the data, um, they'll usually give you the measurements of what that square is, how big the square is. You need to just cross check that when you're looking at your service information and you're using the aftermarket tool, just kind of cross check those two, two to make sure that you're using the same uh, dimensions. Um, that's very, very beneficial. But if the, if an aftermarket is saying, Hey, you're going to use a smaller square, but you're going to move it closer to the car to offset for the size that I don't feel is a good, uh, a good practice to follow. Um, it's better to, to follow the same dimensions that the, that the OEM is, uh, dictating. Um, and again, this is another, this is a Hyundai Kia type, uh, target here. Um, it's also used by uh, Tesla uses this, um, this target, they give you all the dimensions. You could actually make this target up yourself and, um, and have it take those dimensions and go to a printer and have the, have the printer put it up on a board. But the OEM, they give you this tripod here and then they, they, there's also some other measurements, um, for the, for the, uh, pitch and, and yaw and the aftermarket stuff it basically it's rock solid. It just has you square it up with a vehicle. So there's no question that you, you don't have it uh, pitched or odd. And here you've got a challenge with possibly having that easily pitched um, on its uh, single post. Um, here's another case. This is a vehicle that was actually in our shop and uh, it came in for a wheel alignment. Uh, the customer had uh, just installed new uh, coilover, uh, special coilover shocks on it. It's kind of an off-road deal. This is a Ford Raptor, and I'm guessing this truck probably cost about sixty to seventy thousand uh, dollars new. Uh, this is a 2018 model year truck, and it has a camera on the on the windshield, and it also has a radar sensor up in the front grill. And I, we're working hard with my front office to make sure that when we get a car that comes in for any type of procedure, we're looking at the inventory on that vehicle to determine if there's any other operations we need to do following a uh, procedure. And alignments are one that typically dictates some type of operation. The problem here was that we ran the vehicle through our normal service information and we went to the went to the uh, uh, instructions for doing a wheel alignment and there was nothing in there saying, Hey, aim the camera. However, in our wheel alignment program, um, fortunately it gave us a, a big warning when we were into the, when we first fired it up and it said, Hey, uh, this camera alignment is going to need to be done whenever these things are done. If you look at the second bullets, their change in tire size or a suspension repair or wheel alignment. Uh, so here you've got to do the uh, camera aiming on this vehicle. It's also very important that you pay attention to the fine print. There are sub notes uh, attached all over the place, and it's very, very critical that the technician take the time to read it. I have been guilty myself of you know, just going real quick and just blowing through the service information and missing the fine print. And if you look at this here, it says uh, the alignment completion is indicated on the diagnostic scan tool. If the alignment is unsuccessful, check the in interior mirror for proper installation. And then the second note, it says the front camera malfunction service required message in the instrument panel cluster disappears as soon as the system is aligned, okay? And that's the message you're going to see when you put it into this mode. It isn't, a, it isn't very hard to do. You just have, this, have to have the scan tool. You're going to go into the menu system. You're going to make sure that the car is sitting on a level surface. The, the tire pressures are correct. You've completed the alignment. And you're going to go in and push a button to say, hey, we're going to relearn the camera system. And then you take the car out and drive it drive it in the environment, and it's going to basically learn. And, uh, and so we, we were able to complete that process pretty quickly. But the other thing here is that I like to always um, exercise any other systems that are on the car, uh, especially uh, the adaptive cruise control. And on this particular car, I knew right away by looking at the controls, it has this set setup that's on the, on the right side here. And you see the little the, the two arrows opposing arrows close together, further apart. Those are the selector for 
selecting your distance or your following distance in the cruise control mode. So that told me that it has adaptive cruise control. However, in order to turn it on, even though there's an on off button right there, you have to dig into the instrument panel or the, uh, they call it the human machine interface. And I had to go through multiple menus and I found where it was actually turned off. So I had to turn it on and then take the car out and drive it and exercise everything. And, and you, it, it's always good practice to, to go through that and make sure everything works. Well, I did that. Everything worked just fine. Um, we gave the car back to the customer. And um, when he was checking out, uh, I explained to the, him, I said, hey, by the way, I turned on the adaptive cruise control for you. Um, I noticed it was off. And he replied, he says, wow, I didn't even know it had that system on the car. So one, one of my points here is that consumer education is, is a big opportunity. And I think, or I feel that if the service uh, de delivery folks out there in the aftermarket are highly tuned into this uh, advanced driver assistance um, technology, and they can begin to transfer that knowledge into the customer, into the client, and now they can basically show themselves as a proved a trusted individual uh, or entity, um, you're going to help move people into the next generation of technology, in my opinion. So I'm working on uh, creating some curriculum here in my shop because I want to basically host some classes, uh, some technology classes just for uh, uh, drivers out there. And um, I'm hoping to get some marketing around that so that uh, it possibly can bring some recognition to the business as well. And uh, perhaps I can collect some, uh, some new clients. Uh, my wife and I bought a brand new car uh, a few months ago uh, as a Toyota and it has everything on it. It has all the, you know, adaptive cruise and lane departure warning and uh, collision avoidance. And we when we were out taking it for a drive, uh, the salesperson was in the back seat. And uh, she was going on and on about how the ADA, how these ADAS systems work, where everything she was telling me was completely wrong. I mean, the way she was describing how they work and what they do, uh, it's unfortunate, but these folks are not, this is such complicated technology, they are not trained. And I believe that uh, it, you'll be far ahead if you get on in front of this technology and, uh, and, and learn it because people are going to gravitate to this stuff and, and how they, they like technology. Um, this is what I'm observing here is that people, this is what's selling cars, uh, this technology. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, so here's another challenge. This is a couple years later, a uh, couple year model year later vehicle, 2020 uh, vehicle. And uh, it's a 2020 Ford Ranger. And again, it's got an adaptive cruise control with a radar sensor. It's got a camera in the front. Uh, same setup. If you want to do your camera, you're going to go into the scan tool. You're going to exercise the uh, um, exercise the scan tool to tell it to go into that mode. This particular vehicle, um, th this is one that I was prepping for a class on. We could not get the factory tool to initiate that camera process. Part of the or the part of the, the first step was basically to measure the wheel arc height in the on the front wheels. And so you take a measurement on each wheel and you input that into the scan tool. And as I inputted those numbers, it, they wouldn't take. It, it just I'd go to the next screen and, and it would just it would just stall out. It wouldn't go any further. I grabbed the aftermarket tool, repeated the process, put the numbers in, executed the drive came back, everything was fine. It, it calibrated. I went back in with the factory tool. I saw the new numbers in there um, that I had put in with the, the aftermarket tool. I tried to put the old numbers back in, right? Thinking that maybe there was some, some, something goofy there. It wouldn't take those numbers either. So this again is software. Um, this is a software bug. Uh, this, this, this Ford here is actually using a brand new platform, a new technology platform. So it requires a different scan tool than what's been traditionally used in, 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 in the past, which is the uh, IDS setup. Um, but here's the other challenge here. This car, to do your radar calibration, uh, one, your special tool you need, you see that you can probably get one of those at the hardware store. 
It's just a matter of putting the vehicle on a level surface, putting a level on the front of it, and then adjusting a screw to get the, uh, get the unit level. Then you need to go into the scan tool. And unfortunately, on, on this later model car, this vehicle with this new architecture, this radar system, Ford has decided that this is now in, a, um, in an environment that it wants to authenticate the user into, okay? So it just doesn't want anybody into that, into that system and, and clicking buttons. So here in the States, they want to, um, they, they're using a trusted uh, uh, secure partner, somebody that has a trust factor with the aftermarket. And that is the NASTAF group, the National Automotive Service Task Force. And if you've got a security credential with the National Automotive Service Task Force, you can log into this vehicle, but you're creating a record of doing this. They know who, when, and where, and what processes are being performed on the vehicle. So the reason they're doing this is because, you know, these systems have control over the latitudinal and longitudinal um, aspects of the vehicle. And the cybersecurity is a huge, uh, a huge thing. Um, so this, this is something to be aware of because this is probably going to be coming your way as well. But it is fortunate because now the aftermarket has a gateway into an OEM level uh, operation through a trust factor, um, which, is, which is pretty awesome. Um, and this is basically what the tool looks like. It basically pops up, you log right in, now you're creating your, your access, and then you go in and, and do, your, do your job. Pretty cool. So if we look at, uh, this is looking at a European vehicle, uh, an Audi. I was at the LA Auto Show in Los Angeles here, and I'm, I'm just about 35 miles east of Los Angeles. So to give you some uh, geo perspective, I uh, went down to the LA Auto Show. This is 2019. So this is you know just before COVID and the world totally changed on us. And I saw this car and I thought, whoa, man, I'm going to take a picture of this thing. Look at, look at all the technology. This thing has uh, laser LIDAR, infrared, radar, uh, a round view camera here. It's got ultrasonic sensors. But look at these sensors, and I don't know if you guys have seen this, but I have, I have one of these sensors right here, okay? This is one of those LiDAR sensors that's sitting up here in the grill that you see, um, and it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, I'm going to show you what this actually looks like. So this thing has a lens on the front of it, and I basically have removed the lens. It's got a heater grid that's on it. And there's not much you can see. If I put the uh, that over, you, it's hard to even see through it. Um, it looks blue when I look through it. But this thing is a super delicate device. It shoots a laser out of this. Uh, this is where the laser comes out. And it's going to hit this mirror. This mirror is basically spinning. And it's it scatters that laser out of the top here and then it's going to reflect back or pick get picked back up by the mirror and it's going to shoot it back into this crazy looking lens right there and what is happening here is that the um, the system is creating a three-dimensional point cloud out in front of the vehicle to give it uh, some perception of what what it has to deal with you know whether there's a a planter, a brick, or a curb, or something there. So, um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because these things are being mounted onto the front of a vehicle in a very harsh environment. And you know, if that car gets in a wreck, there's no way this thing's going to survive uh, a collision. Um, there's just too many precision moving parts in there, and they're just going to they're going to end up dying. Um, but it's it's pretty critical. Um, that we learn what these different systems are because when you are doing service work and so you look at the front of that car and sometimes when you're doing like a uh, timing chain or timing belt service, you have to pull all that off. And when you put it back on, if you look in the service information, usually they will tell you, hey, if you've removed this sensor, you need to calibrate it, recalibrate it to make sure that it's working properly. Um, and then you need to take that car out and road test to make sure that those systems 
are still behaving the way that they were originally designed to, to operate. So this, uh, this has got a video that uh, I'm going to play here in a second. And it's kind of an interesting case study. We had a customer that brought us a vehicle that um, she just bought, uh, bought used. Car only has about 4,000 miles on it. And it's a pretty high featured vehicle. It has uh, adaptive cruise control. It has lane keeping. So it'll keep it in the center of the lane. Um, she brought it to us because uh, she was uh, having difficulty with uh, all the, the light, the warning lights were on. It said uh, auto emergency braking, lane keeping, um, just repeated errors coming up on the, on the screen. But her primary concern was that when she's driving the car down the road, it will just randomly just change lanes. So it's got electric power steering and it basically is, is executing a, a, a turn to the left. And so she really just wanted to get that fixed. She knew that the car she bought it was actually in a total incident where it got, it got wrecked and it got totaled out. So the insurance company said, hey, this is a total. They paid out the owner and they scrapped the car. Well, somebody picked the car back up and then they basically reassembled it and then put it into the marketplace. So um, in California here, whenever you have what's called a salvage vehicle, you have to do what's called a break and light inspection. And this uh, break and light inspection is kind of a, a, uh, a legacy requirement, uh, meaning all you're doing is checking the brake lining. You're making sure that the brake lights work and uh, making sure that the headlights are aimed properly. And that's pretty much it. Nothing to do with any of these advanced driver assistance systems. So it received that brake and light inspection it was then sold to the customer. The customer then put back into service with this behavior. She took it back to this dealer multiple times, and they finally told her that uh, they couldn't fix it. They, they just gave up on it, and she was looking for a solution. So she found us, and I, I saw this as a pretty cool opportunity, and uh, it turned into a pretty cool little story. So let me uh, play this video here for you. All right. Well, we recently were uh, tasked with solving a complaint on this 2019 Honda that had a salvage title, which in the state of California means that it uh, had to have a mandated brake and light inspection. Well, the complaint on this was that the vehicle randomly would uh, jerk to the left and actually make a lane change uh, if you weren't paying attention. And also all of the uh, ADAS related warning lights are on the ACC, LKAS, AEB, and so on. And uh, so we did our walk around uh, to take a look at the vehicle, uh, confirmed that all the lights are on. Took a look to confirm that it had uh, factory glass in it, which was good. And uh, so now we wanted to take it out for a road test to see if we could verify the complaint. And we did. So now I got the steering wheel cranked this way. And I'm going to lift on the throttle. Boom. See that? So after that experience, we brought the vehicle in for an inspection and found that the left lower control arm pivot bolt uh, was backed out. So we performed an alignment of all the adjustable angles, got them in, and then uh, performed a complete vehicle scan, which we came up with a B. 2A60-54, static camera aiming incomplete, uh, P2583-54, millimeter wave radar aiming incomplete, and a, a P2583-76, temporary stop of the integrated driver support system, misalignment of the millimeter wave radar. Looked like it had a new radar sensor on it, so we performed all the calibrations on the vehicle. All right, so yeah, we, we got that thing dialed in and everything worked just fine. Uh, pretty cool uh, pretty cool setup there. Um, the lady was ecstatic that she got her car back because she, she had already uh, given up on the fact that she was gonna have to deal with some morning lights and all kinds of weird stuff, but uh, we got that car back together. But this is a classic case where I believe what happened, why it kept going back to these shops and didn't get a complete 
or a successful repair is because they were looking at all the technology and assuming the technology was causing the, the problem. And the main problem was that that lower control arm bolt being out, it was causing enough movement on the power steering where the torque sensor, the torque sensor is the main input to tell you to, hey, I want to, I want assistance going to the right or to the left. And so that's what was giving it the tug. It was giving it enough input on that torque sensor to, to make a left change. And uh, I'll tell you, when I was driving the car and it did that, if there was a car to the left of me, I probably would have hit them. And that that's pretty scary uh, that this lady was given that car and put it back into service. So uh, pretty cool. So here's uh, kind of, we're, we're sort of at the end here. So what's coming? Um, I have been driving a Tesla Model 3 for the last three years and uh, awesome car. And recently, uh, you know, I've been trying to study everything to do with the ADAS stuff. And it's really difficult to get much information on these vehicles. Uh, you can't get really any scan data uh, on these cars. You can't get any tooling unless you're a, a you know, Tesla certified body shop, a collision shop in the aftermarket. And at that point, you're only limited on certain things that you can get access to. And I, I've never seen the inside of the scan tool. Um, so it's, uh, it's a little frustrating, but um, recently, uh, I've been really trying to push the envelope, and there are there are multiple CAN buses on this vehicle, and there are guys out there that are figuring out how to communicate with the CAN bus, how to interpret the data, and uh, I recently acquired a, a couple of pieces of hardware that allow me to install a device that ties into two different CAN buses on the vehicle. And it also then becomes a server. It's a Wi-Fi server. It also is a data logger. And I'm using a, a little app here. So this is a little video of an app that runs on your phone. And it is actually showing up here in the top left, it's showing an overlay of data. So this is actually the steering angle. Uh, this is, uh, gotta look closely here. Uh, that's actually the speed. Okay, this down in the lower left um, is the actual width of the lane uh, in meters. And then this pit here is um, the left lane line marker, whether that lane line marker is there and it's able to use it. It'll say fused when it's uh, able to, to see it. This data, now these four pids, these are, you can control these, you can, tell it whichever PIDs you want uh, on the screen. But uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is that there are a lot of folks out there right now looking at the service cycle of doing an ADAS calibration and then taking the car out and driving it and making sure that everything is working properly, uh, making sure that the, you know, the lane keeping is working, uh, adaptive cruise is working. And it's hard to validate that. So there are some folks out there that are making an app where you put it an adapter on the windshield, it's recording your drive and you're kind of narrating, but it's not able to actually see the data that's taking place on the car. So imagine if you had this and I, we're getting close here. I, I would love to see this uh, across applied to other vehicles, but uh, we'll play this little video here. And I'm actually, this is me driving to work. I'm in what's called uh, navigate by autopilot. So I have a destination I'm driving on the, the highway and it's going to exit automatically. And the exit I get off on it, it's pretty complicated. It has a pretty, pretty cool curve. And I'm just going to let this thing actually drive itself off the, uh, off the freeway and, um, and exit. So watch, watch this behavior and look at the, uh, look at the data. That's on.
So what do you think about that? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, it's amazing. Cool stuff. <laughs> so anyways, that is, that's my little presentation today. I, I hope I was able to bring uh, something of interest uh, to, to anybody watching. Uh, and uh, if you've got any questions, uh, you've got my contact information right there on the screen. Um, you can email me. Um, you can contact me through the, uh, the Garage Network uh, folks. Um, so I'll hand it back to you guys. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Uh, uh, Costa, yeah. Yeah, look, we did have one question, actually, regarding around training for the um, and processes on, on the, um, I think you discussed it a bit already in your, um, in your slides, but training for, um, for ADAS is quite similar to a dealership compared to um, aftermarket beyond the tooling. For the for the training, um, the training that's being offered, um, you know, I've taken a lot of dealer training, uh, basically virtual type training, yeah. um, and it's pretty good, but it it does not go very deep. Um, a lot of the training that I've been doing is trying to bring the the perspective of what are these cameras actually looking at, how do they process, or what what are they actually tasked with, how does the radar signal look. Um, what are you doing when you're calibrating? And so I've got a number of instruments that I use here in the shop or in the class that visualize a lot of this. And um, I don't know if you guys have seen the, the video that I have. Um, it's, it's on YouTube. And it, uh, it talks about the convolutional neural networks and it shows the camera and it's identifying uh, vehicles and objects, and I'm riding a bike around in, inside the inside my shop, and you can actually see a radar signal. Well, we use we use those tools to show the technicians what what it is that these cameras are are looking at. This is not the stuff that they're teaching at the dealer. In fact, I had a guy from Toyota reach out to me and said, "Hey, I came across your video. I want to know how you're getting these. How are you doing all this?" Because we want to put that in our training program in the dealer or in the, in the OEM uh, manufacturer training. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's good foundational uh, training, but uh, honestly, there's not, uh, <laughs> they don't go deep enough uh, for me. And I, I think that to get that information to the technician, so the technician has a good visual on how the, the behavior of these systems work and how the, the different sensors can, um, can interact with each other and how the vehicle is making decisions. Um, I think the aftermarket again is uh, is going to be on top of that, uh, bringing also forth the uh, the, the challenges, right? Because the dealer typically they they see the new car, and then they see they see it for the first three three maybe four years, and then they they leave. A customer after it's out of warranty, they're out in the in the aftermarket, and so they're not seeing the some of the crazy challenges out there, especially when the car gets in a collision and then they put it back together and then things don't work. Um, usually it's going to the aftermarket folks to, to figure that stuff out. So um, I think the aftermarket is a little stronger uh, in the training and, and, you know, they're, they're on that edge um, looking to, to solve these uh, challenges. Does that, uh, does that answer your question? I think it does. Now on the back of that one, cause you didn't mention a few things in that, so with the customers and sort of we're going to start seeing these customers, um, what do you think is a way that us as, you know, independent workshop owners or even technicians can sort of help in educating that customer? Well, one, um, I, I'm a firm believer that we need to have the higher level of knowledge about the vehicle systems than the client. But some of these clients, uh, especially when you get into the electrified vehicles, they, they, some of these clients are very sharp and um, they study a lot of this stuff. So they may have higher knowledge, but here's the deal. If you're not, um, if you're not fluent in this stuff and you do a service operation on a car and you're not really affecting any of those systems, but you give the car back to the customer and they, for some reason, turn something off accidentally or whatever, and they notice it's not working. And they come back to you and say, hey, ever since you touched my car, and this has happened to us, ever since you touched my car, now this is not working. So how does that look 
to the shop that isn't familiar with the systems and able to mitigate that, you know, that, that particular event. Um, so I, I strongly feel that, you know, you need to have your front staff uh, fluent with what's going on with the car, especially when they go out to check the customer in they they should be doing a visual inventory of saying, Hey, wow, I see the camera. It's got a camera in the windshield. Um, you know, a lot of times you can see there's a, there's some sort of indicator to let you know that there's a radar sensor up front. So if that car is coming in for a, a major service, you need to make sure that you're accounting for any uh, operations that need to take place there. Um, we've had customers come up the drive and say, oh my gosh, these two light, these warning lights are on on my dash. I don't know what this is all about. Well, they're just two little, two lights, you know, it says uh, ACC and LKAS. And I had my service advisor, this, this happened a while back. My service advisor came and got me and said, hey, what, what are these two lights? What does that mean? And I said, well, we should know that. We should know what that is right away. And you should be able to then look either at the dash or at the steering wheel or whatever. Well, there was one button that the guy pushed and it turned those systems on. And um, so, you know, I, I, again, I strongly feel that we need to have the higher level of knowledge, the upper hand on these technologies. So when you're dealing with the customer, you're able to transfer some of that knowledge and give them the assurance that, hey, you are the expert. Um, and you are the trusted individual that, that they're going to continue to return your vehicle, their vehicle to you for service. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And Does I think um, you, you are actually very right because I'm, I've spoken to a few guys over the last few years and, and some of them mean the idea that, oh, you know, I'm just going to ignore those systems and not work on them. But then when you talk about something as basic as a lower control arm causing such a drastic effect down the chain where it's changing its own lanes. I think there's no way around not trying to understand the tech. Like we're going to have to, if you want to stay in the game, we're going to have to. Well, I think, I think right. the, the big thing with that is customer confidence. They, they don't have the, con- the perception and your customers having the confidence in you to be able to repair their car. Uh, I think it's really important that we know all of these systems and that's a, a, a really interesting fact that you go it's why we need to be going to those sorts of car shows if they are around or having a look at what the new technology is and familiarizing ourselves with them in in, within our customers cars i think you're right scott you know and also yeah from a training perspective i totally understand where you come from as mechanics traditionally um we need to understand we want to understand once you can understand the inner workings of a device like the the way that that lidar operates, you get an you get a a, a a better understanding of how to calibrate it, how it can go wrong, and and the fact that literally, like you said, there's no way that this could withstand any form of impact. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, for, exactly. for us in Australia, even if that's an animal impact, be it a kangaroo, a bird, uh, you know, mm-hmm. something something coming oh, out yeah. the middle of the road, you know, they, they wouldn't it wouldn't it just wouldn't survive. Yeah, exactly. And and one of the other things that I recommend to, to these shop owners, uh, business owners, is that, hey, you know, if, if your staff is not driving cars with these features on them, um, you know, one, they should be driving their clients' cars to make sure that they understand them. Get the owner's manuals. A lot of the owner's manuals you can download uh, off the internet, right, and, look, and start looking at the them. But renting a car, renting these cars with these high features and having them for a day or so in the shop, getting all the technicians uh, to drive the cars and, and under get seat time with how the behavior of the system is and what it's doing, um, it, it will increase your uh, probability of, of having a successful uh, engagement with these systems versus somebody that doesn't know anything about these systems. Yeah, right. Excellent idea. That's a really good idea. That is excellent. Yeah. Never would have thought of that. That's a really good idea. Yeah. And that's why I love driving the Tesla every day. It's, uh, it's the, the car has got a lot of tech on it and, um, it's, it's amazing. In my opinion, I feel it's a decade ahead of the other cars that are out there. I mean, I'm driving my wife's car and when we first got it, we're driving it down the road. We engage the cruise control and the lane keeping. 
and it's going down the highway and you can just feel it. It's like, it's ping ponging in the lanes. It's, it's finding the, the center. And my wife goes, she goes, uh, you can fix that. Right. And I said, no, I'm pretty sure that this is the best that they could do. Um, and she goes, well, that's not how your car behaves. And I said, well, that's, <laughs> that's because I'm driving a Tesla. Tesla oh, hasn't wow. figured out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah. Cause it's Tesla is basically on rails. I mean, it is, uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing. The, the behavior, um, is pretty cool. Yeah. I haven't, I, we, we, we had a customer's one I could drive around the block, but I wasn't game to try any sort of hands-free driving. I was like, no, nah, I'm not doing that in someone else's car. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. And even, um, you know, we've, we've got, I don't know, five or six clients with uh, different Teslas, uh, model threes, model S's. And, um, you know, the model S is a little bit different on the controls for the cruise, the adaptive cruise. And so I get in the car and I'm thinking I'm going to engage it by doing the same thing that I, I do in the model three. Well, that wasn't the case. There's another lever you have to use. Um, so, uh, yeah, familiarity with the vehicle. Uh, again, if you're going to road test the car with the customer, you're going to have to instill confidence in them that you know Excuse how me. the vehicle operates and and uh, and so on. Because customers basically they they're they're feeling you out, right? They're they're going, hey, do it. Does this guy really know what he's doing? Absolutely, uh, guy or gal. So you know, this is this is my my push right now is the industry needs to really step up and become highly familiar with this. Uh, the, these uh, technologies. Absolutely. I, I did have a question for you, Scott. What do you think the challenges are going to be for the independent automotive? What do you, as a business owner, what do you think the uh, the biggest challenges are for you, are, are for you and your business moving forward in 2021? Yeah, um, I, I think. Well, right now, um, used cars are. It's hard to find used cars. People are finding out now that it's worth it to keep their car going, invest money and to keep their, their car rolling. We are busier than ever right now in our, in our service uh, business. Um, you know, last year was kind of a lull. Um, I think the, the bigger challenge, you know, as people can start buying new cars, say the next uh, couple of years, um, those cars are coming with a lot more newer technology and these ADAS systems are getting better and better. So you're going to have, you're going to have these older legacy cars that have some ADAS systems on them that just don't work all that well. And now you're going to have newer technology. Um, it's uh, the biggest challenge is staying ahead of the curve on the, on the vehicle technology uh, so that we can uh, continue to, to, you know, bring the service, you know, here in the States, we, in the aftermarket, we service 70% of the vehicle fleet out there. So the dealership, the OEM mm -hmm. dealership, they don't have the uh, bandwidth for this mm -hmm. uh, kind of kind of stuff. Yeah. That's huge. I don't know. I don't know what else. I, I don't know what it is. That's seventy percent. I feel is, is massive. It's huge. It's massive. It is massive. And um, so the, the 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 manufacturers actually rely on the aftermarket, and this is why we see Toyota, GM, Ford. Um, some of the other manufacturers, they're, they're pretty friendly to the aftermarket. They want to make sure that we have access to service information. We can, you know, we can buy that service information, so we can deliver a competent service, uh, experience for their clients and keep those clients in those cars. So the average year, uh, age of a vehicle is 12 years, roughly. And here where we're at, the climate is so good that it's, it's easy to see 20 year old cars in our shop all the time and they're in good shape and we keep them, keep them rolling. That 20 year old car, if it went to the dealer, they wouldn't have anybody there that even knew anything about it. Um, that's, that's just the way it is. They, they have a lot of turnover. So, um, I, you know, they, they do appreciate the aftermarket, but, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a pretty tall order to stay on top of multi brands and, uh, stay competent. And, and I think you're going to have to continue to market yourself to that client and let them know that you are the trusted partner. And this is why it's a good decision for them to come to you, uh, to your facility rather than go to the OEM uh, dealership. I, I don't know if you've been following Scott, but we've been lucky enough to get the legis the right to repair legislation finally got passed. 
So the, the manufacturers yes. have 12 months, well, July next year. So by roughly this time next year, we have to have access to that service information. So uh, so it's been really, we've had a win. Uh, but again, we're going to be getting awesome. what we wish for. <laughs> we're going to get access yes. to a lot of info. Yeah, I have been staying in touch with that. Uh, so that's that's great, great news. Um, I, I really hope that the OEMs uh, uh, step up to the plate and and fulfill the the requirements. Um, and uh, yeah, I've uh, I, I know you guys have been been really battling for that for some time, and uh, finally I've crossed that uh, that threshold and. Uh, and, and brought some brought some relief, right? Some some high uh, high hopes there. So I hope that that. Have you seen any impact yet? Have you seen any uh, OEMs? Yeah. No, there's not there yet. Have been a, there, yeah, no, there, cost of there. No, there have been. There have been a couple that are starting to ease into access because yeah, right. it's a ten million dollar fine for them. I believe that. Um, I believe that we can now buy the not 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 our, not cars that we service all the time, but I believe you can now buy your Peugeot credits. Um, to get access to Peugeot information, uh, something that you did mention before, Scott. How many, how many manufacturers do you think there are in America, like in the states? Like, what, what's your car park? You know, you've got GM, Ford, and most of the Euros, or what's? Or... Yeah, you've got a, you've got a dozen manufacturers, roughly. Yeah, you have something like eighty, I believe, right? Yeah, we've got a big. We're going to yeah, be car park. Car park, yeah, big variance. Yeah, so know. in order for a manufacturer to bring a car into the U.S., uh, they've got to meet all kinds of uh, strict uh, regulations. Uh, so there's a lot of lot of loopholes to jump. You know, a lot of lot of challenges. So that's why you don't see an influx of all these uh, all these you know, different manufacturers. Uh, pretty high threshold to bring bring a car here into the into the states. Yeah, I believe your emission standards are quite higher than ours as well, so they can sort of sneak a few in Australia a few years behind mm -hmm. our emissions. Yeah, we don't have any emission standards really. <laughs> I think I we trying. copied we copied Cal I think we're Euro four or Euro. Yeah, five we're still way like behind. This, so we're way behind yeah. something else. Huh? Well, you have no. OBD, right? You yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we just got introduced last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. All right. Uh, Brian, I hope that uh, I, I hope, this, uh, Sorry, I hope my presentation was uh, beneficial for you, for you and your uh, your your followers out there. Um, and uh, that was excellent. What, what about uh, your your Dyg Do you want to maybe let listeners know about that? Yeah. That about? Um, so Diagnostic Network, you know, it's uh, it's. Primarily, it's you know a lot of users in the states here, but uh, we've got folks from, from all over the globe. A uh, lot of diagnostic discussion, a uh, lot of problem solving going on. Um, there's some really interesting uh, things that, that pan out. Uh, so we're in our third year since launching this, uh, this uh, new platform, uh, which launched in 2018. And uh, we just crossed uh, 11,800 subscribers. Uh, so we're on our way to 12,000 here and, um, you know, things are, things are moving along. We're, we're, uh, developed, you know, this platform is, uh, it was fresh and clean and, um, and it's pretty easy to, uh, to, to find what you're looking for. Um, you know, so if you're interested in just certain, certain types of discussions, um, uh, whether you want to look at questions that are, that are being posted, or you want to look at case studies. Or if you want to look at certain topics, uh, whether they're related to network communication, diagnostics, drivability, emissions, uh, propulsion, um, and so on, there's there's all sorts of stuff that you can actually filter and and set up your your uh, your desires for uh, your feeds and notifications. Highly recommended. Um, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's also a you know we have a resource section there. A lot of guys are asking, hey, where's the way from library at? Well, we have what's called a resource uh, area, and we got. Uh, I, I worked with a, a handful of uh, top level diag techs out there um, in the in the very beginning, and uh, they gave me access to their. They sent me their libraries of of content, and I filtered through them, and we sub started submitting them into what's called the resources area. So if you log into the site. And, um, and you just pull down up at the top, it says all messages, you pull down 
where it says resources, you're going to see um, you're going to see a feed of all the stuff that's being added there. And then you can go and click search. You can filter by manufacturers. You can say, hey, all Asian manufacturers, all European, or you can go down, start drilling down into them. But um, the cool thing here is that we we're working on some pretty cool search technology uh, that will allow you to get right down to what it is that you're looking for. So, you know, a lot of engines have specific uh, product codes. Um, you might have like an, you know, like an LS motor. You might have a... Uh, L LS1, LS4, or LT, um, LLY, where you can type that in and maybe type the type of signal you're looking for. So crank sensor or the acronym, the, the OBD or the SAE acronym, uh, uh, CKP. So you type in those two little things, it's going to take you right to the, the content that you're looking for. So we're continuing to tweak our, our search. We're actually working on a brand new search plat, uh, search operation that's going to do some pretty crazy stuff, um, kind of like what Google does, but it's for the automotive uh, people. Um, I know you guys probably use Google for doing research, uh, but this will be like something you want to go to to search because it's going to pull data, uh, curated data that's in other areas and help bring some of that content to you. So we're working on on making Diagnostic Network a, a true a uh, high-valued asset for the modern diagnostician. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's great. Pretty cool. It's great. I, I joined when you were back. Was it 2019 you were in Australia, Scott? That was actually 18. It was just before 18. we were launching this. So it was yeah, kind yeah, of an interesting, uh, <laughs> interesting dilemma. So when, when I made arrangements for going down there, I didn't know I was going to be doing this new, uh, this new platform. Uh, but, um, but, yeah, it was such a privilege to come down uh, to Sydney, I've never been been there before, and uh, and then be part of the the AA AA uh, event, and uh, it was uh, pretty amazing. I, I was blown away, and you know I got to visit a bunch of shops, and and Gil Gil Shear came up to me, and yeah, he, said, hey. Gil. he he goes, hey, you got to go to this guy's shop. And he, <laughs> that's when he introduced you to you, Mike. He goes, you got to go to this guy's shop, and I said, okay, I, I, I'm going to go to that guy's shop. So, <laughs> I sure, I sure did. And man, I'm glad I did. Um, I know you had the longest commute probably of, of all the guys in here uh, <laughs> to, commute to work. So, so yeah, the downside to living next door to your business is that it's hard to, to step away from it, but two, you don't get a lot of seat time in the car, right. To, to see how the, the vehicle true. behaves or, true. or maybe drive the car home. That's got an intermittent problem, right. right. I've, I've done that drive the car home. Uh, so, so Mike, you might have to get a second residence uh, somewhere. To... We'd like to say a huge thank you to Scott Brown. If you'd like to know a little bit more about what he's doing, jump over to his website, diag.net. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, our podcasts, or join our private automotive technician Facebook group. They are all called The Garage Network. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode of TGN Talks.